Christ and uh, bring this church to the next level. Amen. Amen. Oh, you can be seated. Um, I'm not going to be before you long. Uh, Sister First Lady Kearney talked about a lot of things on Sunday, God letting things die, and I thought that was a powerful word. And uh, Sister Kalithia was mentioning a lot of things about how church has been good and services have been good. And I want to take a minute to acknowledge that, you know, because we have been having good services and we've been responding. That's not to say that we can't grow and we can't um, do better in a lot of things. All of us can certainly do that. But we want to make sure that we're celebrating, as they say at work, the win, the, the little things, the small, medium, and large victories that we're having in our lives at church, wherever it is. So... We remember that and want to keep that momentum going, and I think the month of prayer and fasting is definitely going to do that. But I wanted to talk to you tonight, and I don't want to be before you long. Uh, I wanted to open up with a story, and it's a story of Socrates, a well-known Greek philosopher. And it's a story of Socrates and three things that he used. Three filters is what it's called. It's called a sieve, but three sieves that he used, filters that he used to get to his goal, to get to his purpose, faster and the story starts off and it's a, it's a man that runs up to Socrates and the man runs up to him he's all excited and Socrates is just minding his business and he's having a he's having a fine time but the man comes up to Socrates and he says I got something to tell you about your friend your friend is and he's about to say it and Socrates stops him he said hold on I just want to make sure that we're on the same page uh, that I have three filters that I use to figure out if I want to hear about what you're saying. And it's kind of unorthodox and it's kind of unconventional, but he says, okay, what is it? Because I'm about to, I don't want to tell you a story. I, it's from Twitter, it's the rumor mill. And Socrates says, well, the first thing is the, the first sieve or the first filter, and it's the filter of truth. So is what you're about to tell me about my friend, okay. is it true? And the guy's kind of puzzled. He's like, I don't know, dude. Like, I just heard it on Twitter. I just saw it on Twitter. It was trending. I saw it on, somebody posted it on my Facebook line. I thought it was interesting. It was about your boy. So I decided to come talk to you about it. That's all. I'm just over here to try to have a conversation. Socrates says, that's well and good, but let me ask you another question. And the guy was like, I didn't come over here for all this. Socrates, well, hold it just before you finish your story. The second sieve. Is it positive? Is it something that's going to help me move forward? And the man says, again, Socrates, I just came over here to tell you a story. I didn't come over here for all this. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's positive. Probably not. I just saw it on Facebook. I didn't. What are you talking about? And so Socrates said, hold on. Let me ask you another question because the man's still trying to go on with his story. But Socrates continues to interrupt him. I don't want you to tell me anything if it's not true, if it's not positive. And lastly, the last and third and final sieve, is it necessary? And when I say is it necessary, is it going to make me or move me forward in my life, in my journey, whatever destination I'm trying to go to, is it going to move me towards that? And by that time, the guy is frustrated. Socrates, to be honest with you, it's none of those. I just came over here because somebody told me. I heard it. I read it on the wall. I don't know what it is. I just came over. And Socrates, at that point in time, went his own way, and the guy went his own way. And I thought that was an interesting story, especially for us, because we, we talk about trying to get to our destination, and we talk about trying to focus on the right things. And here we see an example of one of the uh, most prolific, one of the greatest philosophers, at least in uh, the Greek province, putting an emphasis uh, on the filter and he's saving himself time and energy just by filtering through the things and wading through the things so he can get to the destination or the purpose that he's trying to get to. And I think for us, and I believe for us, when we can wade through much of that noise quickly, then we can find our purpose much faster. Amen. And that's why I want to talk to you tonight about the domino effect of focus. Amen. So I don't want to be before you long. But the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5 and 8 that we are to be mindful. We are to be sober-minded. We are to be watchful. We are to be focused. And it gives us a reason. It says because your competition, your adversary, as you read there, the devil is, is, is watching you. He's doing the same thing, 
right? Whether you're whether whether you're ready, whether you're supposed to be doing what you're doing, the devil is seeking as a roaring lion to devour you, trying to take over you. There's a there's a popular game, uh, hide and seek. We all know it. And what's the phrase that we all know about hide and seek? After the count, it's ready or not. Here I come. It doesn't matter whether you're ready. It doesn't matter whether you uh, tripped over somebody or you and that other person are hiding in one spot and y'all got confused or whatever. By the time the count is done, I'm coming to get you. And that's what the enemy says to us. Whether you're ready or not, I'm coming for you. I'm seeking as a lion to devour you. I don't care about you. I don't care about you winning. I don't care about your family. It sounds really harsh, but that's how it is with the devil, with the enemy. I'm coming to conquer you. So we have to be, as 1 Peter 5 and 8 tells us, sober-minded. We have to be watchful. We have to be focused. We have, have, we have to rise to a certain level and standard of focus if we are going to conquer a lot of things. So the first domino that I want to talk to you about is setting our focus on God. 2 Timothy 2 and 4 talks about a soldier and it says that no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier and essentially what that is saying is that a soldier whose purpose is to obey his leader's authority that's all I'm really here for is to obey what my leader is saying is to obey what my master is saying I don't have any other direction in life I don't have any other purpose in life but to obey my leader. And by that same token, we must obey and abide by God's direction for our lives. We have to understand that our starting point is always Jesus. And I know because the new year has come upon us and we're doing a lot of brainstorming and we're, do we're doing a lot of vision casting and all that is great, but we have to realize for ourselves that before we do all of that, the starting point has to be Jesus. We have to wake up every day and we have to say it's God's will before our will. Amen. Well, God, I want to I want to build a clinic. God, I don't want to do some type of outreach. I want to make a million dollars. All of that is good. All of that is it's honorable because I know, you know, we got a lot of problems, money and all of that stuff. But we have to go back to God. What is your will? I want to do this. God, can you help me to make a me? God, can you help me to do it? Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But we have to be content with whatever guidance Amen. God gives to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. We must be content with the direction that God is leading us to. The outcome that God is leading us to, we have to be content with that. And I want to slow down a little bit and say this. There's a song by Hezekiah Walker. It's called, Any Way You Bless Me, I'll Be Satisfied. And one thing I find when we're trying to focus on God is that we focus on blessing means favor and, and protection. <clears throat> favor and protection. And we focus a lot on the favor of God. But a lot of times we don't really focus on the protection of God. There's a story about Harriet Tubman leading the uh, people through the Underground Railroad. And I thought it was applicable to us tonight because she used uh, some type of opium, some type of agent uh, on babies to quiet them. And I know it sounds, I'm looking at your face and it sounds like, what? Exactly. That's the exact response I thought I would get. It's unconventional to us now because we, could, we wouldn't do that. But back then, it was for their protection. Because a baby might get tired, might get hungry, might get annoyed and agitated. And as soon as you start crying, the whole thing is up and we're all dying. Everybody's caught. So Harriet Tubman took drastic steps, as we would say today, to protect those who she was leading to freedom. And by the same token, sometimes we complain about the way that God handles us, about the, God, about the way God does us. But we have to understand at the end of the day, it's for our protection. So that 
we can reach the favor that God has for us on the other side. Colossians 3 and 2 says that we have to set our affections on the things above. What does that mean? That means we have to set our affections on the bigger picture. We can't miss the forest for the trees. We can't just look at the trees, look at what's right in front of us. It's good to take one step at a time because those troubles do come, but we have to at the end of the line see, okay, where am I trying to get? That's where the vision is. It's okay to write a vision as the Bible says and to make it plain, but we have to see, okay, God, where are you trying to lead me? God, where are you trying to put my focus? To set our affections. Okay, God, I, I really wanna get to this over here, and I'm really not happy with what you're doing over here. It doesn't really seem like you're protecting me. It sounds, seems like you're protecting my enemies, but I'm going to go with you. I'm going to rock with you. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to try to do everything. That I, that I'm going to try to focus. I'm going to try to get down on my knees because, God, I don't know where you're taking me. But I understand that you're protecting me, and I appreciate that. We have to get that in our minds. The focus, Colossians 3 and 2, as I said, set your affections. Well, I'm hurt. I don't know. What, I, I don't, I'm not moving forward. I can't move forward until I get an apology from this person or, or this person comes back and makes it right with me. And it's not to say that there are some things that don't happen in church that really cut you deep, that physically, mentally, I won't mention them here, but physically, mentally, emotionally, people can really cut you deep. And it's like, well, pastor would never hurt me. Sometimes pastor and first lady do. Sometimes they say stuff that maybe they were having a bad day or Maybe they just felt it in their heart. We're all people at the end of the day. Or maybe a sister or a brother in church says something that you didn't like and it cuts you. But we have to get to the point of, well, you know, even though they said that, I still got to love them. And I still got to keep my, my relationship with God at the forefront. It's got to be the big thing. I've got to make it to that land of favor. So I've got to keep my focus on God. Let's go on to domino number two. And that is to commit to God. Once we get over the focus, we have to commit to God. Proverbs 16 and 3 says to commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. There's a pretty good story that illustrates this. And we all know the story, I think we do, of Peter when Jesus was walking to them on the sea in the storm. The one thing about Peter is that God had his, Jesus had his attention. And we could venture to say that Jesus had the attention of all of the people in the boat. Everybody was paying attention to Jesus. Their focus was on Jesus. But dare I say, it's not enough to just focus on Jesus. You have to commit to God. Amen. Let me tell you, what do you mean? Peter was the only one that actually stepped out of the boat. He wasn't aware what was going to happen once he got out there on dry. On, 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 on. It wasn't even land. Mm -hmm. It was out there on his, you, you can't walk on water. But, but Peter thought, well, if you can do it, may, maybe I can do it. That's a crazy thought. But Peter said, I'm going to commit enough to see if I can do this. There's got to be a commitment for us. We've got to commit to God first to see our plans line up to success. We have to commit to God first to see our thoughts and our ideologies lead to success. But I, I, I think, for me at least, the funny thing is that contracts are tricky. Back in, it, they don't really do it anymore, but you know, places like internet and, and, and cell phone, they get you into a 24-month contract or a three-year contract, and now it's all month to month. And it's... I don't care because it's, it, it benefits me. But sometimes we take that ideology of, well, if I don't like your service, then I can just stop using it and I can go on to the next person. I can literally drop your service in the middle of the month. And I say, well, you know, I'm going to go with somebody else. I don't like your offerings. You talk to me wrong. It's all slanted towards the customer. But unfortunately, I guess fortunately for us, the customer in this situation is Jesus. It's God. We can't do this month to month thing with God to where we decide, well, God, you know, I got the Holy Ghost and I got saved and I got baptized in Jesus name. But this month, I ain't really feeling it. Somebody says something to me that I didn't like and I'm really not feeling coming to church. You know, my leg broke and 
I really can't make it. But you can be on credit. Well, I can't really do it. I'm sick. I'm hurting. I'm tired. And if you're sick, and you're hurt, you're tired, and you're really that way, by all means, I'm not telling you to force yourself when you need to get better. I support that. But what I'm saying is sometimes we make excuses not to do things for the Lord. Amen. And that doesn't necessarily mean coming to church. That means anything. Exactly. That means if I, God asked me to talk to something, well, you know, God, I, they look mad today. I really don't want to talk. I do it. Hey, man, I, I don't know. This don't seem like the right time for me to say anything to. I, I'm trying to get in. Man, I remember one time I was like, so the pastor said, man, you know, you need to, you know, tell somebody that this, this week, tell somebody that Jesus loves them. <laughs> man, like I said, man, you know what? I was in that nurse's station and it was weird, man. Uh, I went in there and I, I didn't even, how could I say this? Me and a woman really didn't get along like that. And I went in there and I said, you know, and it, I, I went in there and I went to say it and it didn't come out. So I went back to the break room and I tried to say it. I, all right, it's, it's going to come out. I went back in there and I was like, you know, I, it was silly because I, I went all around the bush and I finally said, you know what? God loves you. And she was like, what? <laughs> but I, I should have said it the first time, you know, God loves you without doing all of that other stuff. I try to make I'm a very logical person. So I try to make it logical in my mind how I'm going to say it. But sometimes we just got to say it instead of trying to do it like we want to do it. Right. So we can't do this month to month thing. We got to commit to what God is asking us to do. Hebrews 12 and two talks about uh, having challenges. Right. And it talks about not only are the challenges to because if it was just a challenge and it was easy, it wouldn't matter. But those challenges get demanding and they get hard for us. But the Bible says even through those demanding challenges that we have to stay the course and we can't quit. So we have to remember at the end of the day that we have to focus on God. But we also have to commit and say, you know, God, I'm focused. You got my attention and I'm coming all the way with you. So let's go to domino number three. And that is to allow the peace of God in our lives. Isaiah 26 and three says thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That means our peace, our hope, and our connection are in God if there's a caveat there, we focus on God. And I think it's funny because some of us really do have the peace of God in our lives. Peace is staring us in the face. Peace follows us all, the, all day long. It follows us around. But we don't recognize it because we're so busy. Our minds get to the point that complaining but fighting a lot of things, focused on a lot of other things besides what God is trying to do in our lives. And so it takes us a while, even though peace is right in front of our eyes. It's hiding in plain sight. We can't grab it because we're too focused on what we got to do. I got to go pick up the kids. I got to go make dinner. I got to go to this. I got to do that. And man, I'm really tired. I just want to take a nap. We're focused too much on these things and we can't focus on the peace, the hope and the connection that we need from God. Does that make sense? Some of us have it right in our face. It's, it really, and we've all been through this. We have a kid or you have somebody that's staying over your house and they're running in and out and you keep on telling them, you need to sit down, yes. sit down, yes. sit down, sit down. Yes. And it takes them <laughs> running into a tree or something like that, hurting themselves before they finally come in screaming and hollering. You got to bandage them up, give them a popsicle and sit them on that couch so they can watch TV for them to listen to you. Yes. Oh, man, I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, daddy. You got to get them to that place to where they decide, you know what? I should have done that in the first place. Why didn't I do that in the first place? And that's how we are. It takes something earth shaking sometimes. It takes something earth shattering for us to say, you know what, God? After God fixes us up, fixes us up and bandages us up, it takes us to sit down and say, you know what? I should have been doing that the whole time. It's kind of like First Lady was saying about Abraham and Sarah on Sunday. Well, we're going to have a baby. Well, God, you ain't coming through. I don't know what. Well, maybe you can. Well, maybe, Abraham, you can go and do this and we can have a child. 
that God has to reiterate to us after we mess stuff up that this wasn't the promise that I was trying to give to you. This wasn't the favor that I, this wasn't the protection that I had for you. And so we have to realize and understand that when we stop running around, the favor of God has an opportunity to catch us. The peace of God actually has an opportunity to catch us, but we have to allow it to catch us. And instead of it, instead of fighting it off is that, you know what? I really don't really don't care about that. We do. And when the peace of God comes into your life, not really talking about money or anything, but it's just like you really don't worry about bills. You don't worry about nothing. You're like, you know what? I know you're trying to hurt me. I know what you, what you just said. You're trying to hurt me. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to go in here and watch TV. Don't worry about it. But that's the level that we got to get to. Amen. So let's go to domino number four and have a few other, a couple of, not even a few other points after this. Let's go to domino number four, and that is to control the fear factor in our lives. Isaiah 41 and 10 says, don't be afraid. Essentially, fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Don't be afraid. Fear is one of the biggest things that causes us to lose focus. I'm not talking about fear in the traditional sense. It's fear of a monster or you got a phobia or something like that. But a lot of us, if not everybody, we're afraid to fail. We're afraid of the unknown. And that's why the disciples stayed in the boat. Because I don't know what's out there. I don't know what's going on. I'm scared. I'm uncomfortable. There's situations that's going on in my life. I don't really know how to handle them. We have to control that fear. It's not saying that I won't. Be, I'm going to run out here and I'm going to be. It's not going to bother me. You're going to have that fear. But you have to. The Bible says to cast your cares on God. God, you got to help me, man. I'm still, you told me to do it, but I'm still scared to do it, man. I'm really trying. I'm really, can you, can you help me out? But it make, when I think about it, it makes sense because the fear comes from us doing something a certain way for so long. We get it in our mind. We get a pattern and even we don't want things falling through the cracks. If I just do it my way, I can get it done. And there's a saying that goes, like, if you want it done right, you have to do it yourself. But that's not the case with God. God is going to do it right regardless of if you're there or not. That's how it goes. And our fear, even subconsciously a lot of times, is, well, you know, God, I, I appreciate what you did. I said you were an on-time God, but uh, I really wanted A then B, but you put B, then C, then A. I didn't want it like that. I wanted it A, B, C. And I've been telling you for a long, long time, I wanted A, B, C. I've been telling you for years, I wanted A, B, C, but you switched the order around on me. We gotta give, we have to give God the leeway to do whatever he wants, how he wants in our lives. We have to let, how many times have you said to yourself, how many times have you, Walked in somewhere, you you probably mentioned it. You like you saw somebody in the kitchen or some something like that, or you you in the car and somebody's driving. He's like, you need to slow down. You need to stop doing that, man. I wouldn't be cooking like that, man. You clean the wrong way. Mm-hmm. How many times have you said that to somebody? All the time. It's because we have a certain way of doing things, yes. but we have to understand. Well, maybe that person wouldn't do it like you. They say it's, what is it? It, it, it? It's multiple ways to get to the skin of cat. There's multiple ways to do it, right? And so we have to understand that if they are right with God, that's really none of our business. Amen. Amen. If, God is, if God is leading them, their family, we might not agree with it. And even if, even if we don't know, even if we have an inkling that, hey, you guys are probably not doing it right. I can tell you that and then leave it at that. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm not going to, hey, I pray for you. Are you doing it right yet? No. Leave them alone, man. Let them go. Let them folks, leave them folks alone. Let them go home. Anyway, I ain't. We have to let God work on us and work on them 
as he sees fit. So we have to let God, and this is the final point on that, we have to let God do his thing and we have to take our hands off of it. And the final point that I want to make is domino number five, staying alert. Luke 21 and 36 says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. Stand before the son of man. Sometimes we get weary. Sometimes we fall asleep. But Luke is telling us here to stay awake, to stay alert. Psalms 119 and 15 tells us to meditate on the things of God. It tells us to fix our eyes on God. But why do we need to stay alert? We have to take advantage of the space and the opportunity and the time that God has given us. Matthew 22, 24 and 22 talks about it a little bit. It talks about except in those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved. But those days shall be shortened for the elect's sake. It's basically saying that I'm not going to give you forever to be saved. I'm not going to give you forever to do what you need to do. I'm talking about uh, one story about the five foolish and the five wise virgins. You only have a certain amount of time that I'm giving you before these things start to come to pass. And they're going to, like hide and seek says, ready or not, I'm coming for you. These things are going to come to pass whether you like it or not. Somebody's going to be successful. Somebody's going to get over. Somebody's going to overcome. Why not you? So we have to take advantage of the space and time that God has given us. Amen. Does that make any sense? Amen. And so Socrates, as I'm closing, Socrates had those three sieves, those three filters, strainers, as we use in food to get the oils and different things out of our food to get the the thing that we want at the end of it have to filter to those things to get to our purpose much faster philippians 4 and 8 i think gives us a pretty good starting point for some filters to use it has six things here and it talks about truth being honorable being just being pure being lovely being commendable why don't you try to focus on these things why don't you try to live by these things why don't you try to emulate these things Become inundated. Let these things just sit on you and seep into your heart, seep into your mind. Focus on these things, these six things, and you should be headed in the right direction. I'll give you one final story. It's a story of we're fixing the well out there. And long before we were even here at the church, we would have the well break down. And one thing about the well is that we would go out there and we would spend two, three hours in the store trying to get what we needed. And we get back here and we try to fix the well and then we'd have to go back to the, sp the store and spend another hour. It's just the commute time and then getting back there and then, oh, do we need this? Well, I'll just buy two and three of this because I don't know or I'll buy this and buy this and buy that. And we waste a lot of money trying to get the tools necessary and the things that we needed in order to get, and f get, get back here and fix the well. But over time, we, we learned, okay, we don't need this. We don't need to buy 50 of that. I don't need that anymore. And over time, it became an assembly line of things that we said, well, this is all we need. And then we just set it up as an assembly line of success. Okay, I'm going to go over here and get this tool. Boom. Oh, I need three tools. Boom. And so that's how we have to be in our lives. God has given us the tools to do a lot of things in our lives, but we have to figure out how to use them. How do I use it? When do I use it? Where do I use it? All those things are important until we get the job done. Now, it doesn't mean that the job is going to be easy. The job's probably going to be challenging, but the process for us becomes more straightforward as we have all that we need to uh, uh, complete the job. So like I said, it's up to us to figure out when, where, and what tool we need. It's a step-by-step -step process from one phase to the next. There's a, I don't know if it's a game, but it's, it, it's called domino toppling where you set the dominoes up in a specific pattern or sequence. And if it's lined up correctly, all you have to do is hit one domino and all of them continue to fall down. Everything be begins to fall into place. So if we set our focus on God, if we commit to God, if we allow the peace of God in our lives, if we work to control the fear factor in our lives and we stay alert, then I believe that's how we will achieve the domino effect of focus in our lives.